The French Lieutenant's Woman by John Fowles Dramatised by Graham White With John Hurt Episode 1 We begin like this with a vivid image captured in sound First, a skyline Good, but this is a coastal town a little less of the bird life, please. Better. It is late March, 1867. The town is Lyme Regis, a small port on the Dorset coast and a location full of history. The day is cold and easterly is blowing. The sea is rough. On the cob, long claw of old grey harbour wall that flexes itself against the sea stands a lone figure, there at the seaward end. Its clothes are black. The wind moves them, but the figure stands motionless, staring out across the water. Yes, I think that paints itself clearly enough. Now hold that. Turn and look north towards land. A couple, strangers to the town, people of some taste, walk down towards the quay. Oh, I see. They are talking. And so, with such a simple circumstance, it begins. Yes, yes, yes. My dear Tina, we've paid our homage to <laughs> Neptune. He will surely forgive us if we now turn our backs on him. Charles, I wish to walk to the end of the cop. But the weather is dreadful. To the end? And I wish to know what passed between you and Papa last Thursday. Oh, very well. So? Very fine port wine passed between us, my dear. I have had a letter from Mama. Ah. Well, in that case, we had a small philosophical disagreement. Over? I tried to explain some of the scientific arguments behind the Darwinian position. Oh, Charles, how could you? You know Papa's views. I was most respectful. Things grew a little heated, but we were reconciled. And Tina, it is proper that you should be afraid of your father, but I am not marrying him. And you forget that I am a scientist. You are a collector of fossils. I am a scientist. I have written a monograph, so I must be. <laughs> now, if you're not careful, I shall begin to point out the fossils in the stones of the cob here. <laughs> Good heavens. I took that to be a fisherman, standing at the end there. Isn't it a woman? I think it is, yes. And I can guess who. Poor Tragedy. A Tragedy? A nickname. The fishermen have a grosser one for her. They call her the French Lieutenant. Woman. Do they indeed? She is a little mad, I think. Please, let us turn back. No. If she springs on you, I shall defend you. Come. Must we? Yes, we must. She stands there at some risk to herself. Who is this Frenchman? A man she is said to have... Fallen in love with? Worse than that. And he abandoned her. They say she waits for him to return. My good woman! Hello! She's seen us. We can't see you here without being concerned for your safety. This wind is easterly and likely to grow stronger. A sudden squall might knock you off your feet. I'm quite safe, thank you. I beg to differ, ma'am. Charles. Well, as you please. But take care. Yes, <laughs> clearly mad. Let us return to my aunt's now, Charles. It is dreadful weather. Oh, I see. At last you've noticed. Mm. Excuse me. <laughs> Dear aunt, I think your sea air has done for poor Charlie. I do apologise. <laughs> oh, I hope it is the air and not our conversation, Tina. No, certainly not. Your conversation is as delightful as your air is refreshing. Although I do fear that Charles feels the limitations of Dorset somewhat after his days of grand tours and his uncle's great house. Tina, don't tease. Oh, but I must, aunt. Once he takes his uncle's title, I shall no longer be allowed the opportunity to tease Sir Charles Smithson. Ladies, <laughs> I assure you that I can think of nowhere I would rather be at the moment than in this very room. Well, I'm afraid we have at least one further social duty to impose upon you whilst you remain in town, Charles. We have been invited to an audience with Mrs. Poultney. 
Oh, no, he will leave me now, aunt. Charles will break off his engagement and run back to Kensington with his fossils <laughs> strewn behind him. I know of the good lady by reputation, mostly through Ernestina's report. Oh, I shall die. She is a particular individual. A species all on her own? Indeed, I think she may be. Speaking of specimens, Charles, we shall encounter that melodramatic character we happened across this afternoon. Really? Yes, she is Mrs Poultney's secretary. We came across tragedy on the cot. Yes, she may well be present. Mrs Poultney likes to have her close at hand. It makes a good motif of her charity. <laughs> she took Sarah in when the whole of Lyme was out to have her ostracised. I am surprised to hear you use her Christian name, Aunt. Well, she is Sarah to me. What was her scandal? If it is possible to discuss it in polite company. Or must I now cover my ears? Ernestina. She was governess for the Talbots. Captain Talbot is a local naval officer. When the man in question came to their house, rescued from a wreck of Portland, he worked his way into her affections as he recuperated, I believe, and on his recovery, she went to him in Weymouth. Her conduct is highly to be reprobated, but I am informed that she did lodge with a female cousin. He made her believe that he would return and marry her once he'd gone back to France and spoken with his family. And since then, she has waited. I can see why the epithet tragedy is so favoured. There are men of low morals, I believe, for whom it is nothing to exploit the weak and the vulnerable. And many of them are French. Now, Mrs Tranter, will I at least be afforded the opportunity of a little paleontology in the morning? Before this engagement. Oh, heavens, Charles. Don't change your plans. The visit's not until Monday at ten in the morning. Sharp, I suppose. Oh, yes, my dear, sharp. Very sharp indeed. <laughs> Good morning, Mr Charles, sir. Good morning, Sam. Am I still in line? Yes, yeah, sir. Here you are, sir. Ain't my fair, is it? <laughs> no. No, indeed it is not. And perhaps I'm too hard on the place. It certainly is a fine view. Shall I shave you now, sir? Yes, do, Sam. The new room is better? Yes, sir. And what is it, then? I sense you have a distinct hump. It's that maid over at Mrs Tranter's, sir. I see her down out there, right across the street, she calls. And what did she call, pray? <sighs> have you got a bag of soup? So I think she was taking a rise <laughs> out of my accent. A satirist, indeed. In lime... I know the girl, the one in the grey dress. Yeah. Mary. Oh, these country girls are much too timid to call rude things at distinguished London gentlemen unless they've been sorely provoked. I gravely suspect, Sam, that you've been fast. Never, sir. On my life. Hmm. <laughs> I have little sympathy, Sam. Now, get me my breakfast. I don't trust you to shave me in this spirit. Yes, sir. There. The scene is set and our action is commenced. Now, to the west of Lyme lies an area known as the Undercliff, a wilderness which was and is an English Eden, created in a mile-long cliffside which has tilted the vegetation towards the sun. In summer, it is the nearest this country can offer to a tropical jungle. But how to create this place in sound, for it is crucial to our story. Let us begin below on the beach at Pinay Bay, with Charles, a foolishly overdressed amateur scientist, searching for those fossils. He is caught up in that familiar Victorian obsession with collection and possession. Let us shift forward in time. Here, I move my watch on a little. Half an hour, perhaps. Discovering that his expedition has almost led him to being cut off by a rising tide, Charles has climbed upwards into the Undercliff's wilderness. He has stopped to quench his thirst, when below the edge of the plateau on which he stands, he sees a figure, a body fallen there, surely. But no, it's a woman, asleep, asleep in the strangest location. A sun trap, almost inaccessible, with a 40-foot drop immediately below as it looks out over the sea. And as he cranes forward, Charles recognises her. It is the woman from the cob, the French lieutenant. Who is it? Who's there? A 
thousand apologies, madam. I happened upon you inadvertently and I lost my footing. I am the more surprised. Indeed. Please. Are you hurt? No. No, no, of course not. I, I have been searching for fossils. I'm sorry to have given you this shock. I was resting. I thought this a private place. Yes. I hope it may become so again. Uh, please. Excuse me. Good day. Good day. I wonder if I might purchase a bowl of milk from your dairy. It's devilishly hot walking out here. You might. Well, thank you. Uh, do you have many walkers passing through here? Enough to sell a bowl too. Ah, yes. Excuse me. Here. Thank you. There's another down below there now, look. Crossing the common. Do you know that lady? <laughs> Aye. Everyone round here knows her. Now, does she often come this way? Often enough. And she's no lady. She's the French lieutenant's whore. That is an uncharitable appellation. I'm a Methodist. I speak as I find. Yes. Well, thank you for the refreshment. Right. Good day. Yes. Yes, sir. A moment, please. Are you surprise me again. No, I was just at the dairy. I saw you pass and felt I must explain myself. I owe you two apologies. I did not know yesterday that you were Mrs. Pulteney's secretary. I fear I addressed you in a most impolite manner. On the cob? Yes, I remember. It's no matter, sir. And just now, when I seemed... I was afraid lest you had been taken ill. I'm quite well. May I not accompany you? Since we walk in the same direction. I prefer to walk alone. It was Mrs. Tranter who made me aware of my error. I am... I know who you are, sir. Ah. Then may I not accompany you? Kindly allow me to go on my way alone. And please, tell no one you have seen me in this place. And all Charles is left with is the afterimage of her haunting eyes and a directness of look which seems to say, Do not come near me. And so it is that later that afternoon, Charles visits Mrs. Tranter's a little preoccupied. <laughs> Ernestina, my dear, I was just finishing a description of my walk this afternoon for your aunt. Now, confess, Charles, you haven't been beheading poor innocent rocks, but dallying with the wood nymphs. <laughs> Very well. You have caught me out. There, aunt, haven't I always said he is not to be trusted? <laughs> <laughs> but now the scene drops. At this point, I feel I need to give you a sense of why it was that the mysterious Sarah should have been concerned that Charles keep her movements a secret. So, I take my watch. I keep the time, but change the date. To two weeks previously, when Sarah's peregrinations in the Undercliff were first the subject of her benefactor's wrath. What have I done, Mrs. Pulteney? You were seen by my housekeeper walking on the Undercliff. But what is the sin in walking? It was declared by Dr. Grogan that I was melancholic, that I should walk for the good of my health and agreed by you. That you might walk? That you were not to go to the sea, or do your staring ritual, or to frequent places where you might be taken to be hankering after the cause of your shame. You will confine yourself to walks where it is seemly. Now you may read to me. Thank you, ma'am. Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. I have written here, Sarah reads. And so she does. And as she does, her eyes are wet with a sadness which, truth be told, had somehow been apparent to Charles when he looked down at her sleeping form and had taken hold in him. And so the question rose for him as it rises for us. Who is Sarah? Out of what shadows does she come? I do not know. This story I'm telling is all imagination. These characters I create never existed outside of my own mind. Listen, I stop my watch. Sarah, Charles, Ernestina stop too. 
My disguised essay on the Victorian age stops with them. You may think that writers always have fixed plans to which they work, but we write for countless different reasons. Only one is shared by us all. We wish to create worlds as real as, but other than, the world that is. And a genuinely created world must be independent of its creator. You see, when Charles left Sarah on her cliff edge, I ordered him to walk straight back to Lyme Regis, but he did not. He gratuitously turned and went down to the dairy, and the idea to do this seemed to come clearly from Charles and not myself. I must respect it if I want him to be real, and I do. And Sarah is just as unpredictable. So let me describe only the outward facts. Despite her lecture from Mrs. Pulteney, Sarah did not refrain from walking the undercliff. She just took great care not to be discovered there. Until that afternoon, when already having been chanced across by Charles, she emerged recklessly in full view of the two men at the dairy. And why? Oh, because she had been shaken by Charles' eyes on her? Because she felt her fall accelerate at that moment? And because, well, simply put, she was late to accompany her mistress at dinner? How? I set my watch running again. It is to a different social engagement that we return. It is the next morning when Charles, Ernestina and Mrs. Tranter call at Mrs. Pulteney's. At ten o'clock, on the dock. Mrs. Tranter, good day. Oh, and to you. I hope you're well, Mrs. Pulteney. I'm in excellent health, by the Lord's mercy. Miss Freeman... Indeed, you look exceedingly well, Mrs. Pulteney. At my age, Miss Freeman's spiritual health is all that counts. Then I have no fears for you. May I present my fiancé, Mr. Charles Smithson? Great pleasure, ma'am. Charming house. It is too large for me. I keep it on for my dear husband's sake. I know he would have wished... <sighs> wishes it so. There hangs his likeness. Ah, I see. Most natural. Their wishes must be obeyed. Just so. My dear Miss Woodruff, it is a pleasure to see you. Will you come to see me when dear Ernestina is gone? Indeed, I would be pleased to. Oh. Uh, Mr. Smithson, Miss Freeman, may I introduce Miss Woodruff, my secretary? Miss Woodruff? Ma'am. A pleasure, madam. Sir? Do please sit. Mrs. Farley will bring refreshment shortly. You're enjoying lime, Mr. Smithson? It is everything I had been led to expect, ma'am. Yes, we are a welcome antidote to the metropolis, I'm sure. Here, simplicity and frugality are necessary watchwords. There's little to distract us from the pursuit of the virtuous life. Indeed, madam. Now, that girl I dismissed... She's given you no further trouble, Mrs. Tranter. Mary, oh, I wouldn't part with her for the world. Mrs. Fairley has informed me that she saw her only this morning talking with a person, a young person. Mrs. Fairley did not know him. No, oh, then no doubt it was Sam, my servant, ma'am. Oh, I meant to tell you, Charles, I too saw them talking together yesterday. I think you should speak to Sam. Oh, but surely we're not going to forbid them to speak together if they meet. There is a world of difference between what may be accepted in London and what is proper here. The girl is too easily led. Your future wife is a better judge of such matters, Mr Smithson. I know the girl in question. I had to dismiss her. If you were older, you would know that one cannot be too strict in such matters. I bow to your far greater experience, madam. Sarah, you've dropped your bookmark. Oh, yes. Allow me, Miss Woodruff. There. Thank you, Mr. Smithson. Oh, Charles! Well, at last I can apologise as I have longed to. I'm so sorry to allow you to be snubbed by such a gruesome <laughs> monster. My sweet, silly Tina, you have only yourself to blame. Why should we deny to others what has made us both so happy? What if this wicked maid and my rascal Sam should fall in love? Are we to throw stones? I know. 
This is what comes of trying to behave like a grown-up. Mm, a very disagreeable kind of grown-up. There are better examples to follow. Mm. Oh, if the worthy Miss Portney could see us now. Indeed. Uh, I know you are suffering, a little Charles. Well, tomorrow we should perhaps begin to plan the Kensington furnishings. I had rather hoped to work tomorrow. More of your wretched grubbing after stone. Well, I spied one or two sites on my last expedition, which I should like to revisit. Oh, very well. But in the evening, I will be all yours. <laughs> Now, I swear as far as I am able that Charles was genuine in his concern to revisit the Undercliff as part of his contentious geological mapping. Though only hours had passed since he had briefly exchanged with Sarah a look of mutual wry humour at Mrs. Pulteney's expense as he bent to pick up that carelessly dropped bookmark. You recall that moment? You think it's significant? Well, Charles had forgotten it. His mind was on science. At least, the majority of it was. So it was that next day he spent a happy, distracted hour in that same wild part of the Undercliff. And it was while breaking for a moment to survey a so far unproductive scene that he caught a glimpse of movement, a black shape, descending a path through the trees above him. At once, Charles sprang up and onto the path and stood. The path was narrow. She had the right of way. She had not yet looked up. Miss Woodruff. Oh, Mr. Smithson. I'm sorry. I surprise you again. No, it is I have disturbed you in your work. Please, I will continue on the path. Oh, be careful. There. Oh, thank you. I dread to think, Miss Woodruff. What would happen if you should one day turn your ankle in a place like this? It does not matter. But it would most certainly matter, my dear young lady. From your earlier request to me, I presume you don't wish Mrs. Pulteney to know you come here. But I must point out that if you were in some way disabled, I am the only person in Lyme who could lead your rescuers to you. Am I not? She knows. She would guess. She knows you come here? Yes. Then you are more independent than I already imagined. May I continue on my way? Uh, Miss Woodruff, I cannot pretend that your circumstances have not been discussed in front of me. I would have expected as much. Now, I have known Mrs. Tranter only a very short time, but I am confident that if you were to... There is what? someone below. What? Come. Come here. Please, here. Stand next to They stood close together, united by the threat of discovery. The air was full of honeyed musk. The voices approached. Come here. Come on, Who is it? I cannot see. No, no, Come stay back here. Two poachers, I fancy. Have they gone? I'm sure. I think it was not uh, necessary to hide. No gentleman who cares for his good name can be seen with the Scarlet Woman of Lyme. Oh, my dear Miss Woodruff. I have seen a good deal of life, and I have a long nose for bigots. There is no impropriety in our meeting in this chance way. Now, will you please leave your hiding place? Thank you. Now, to continue. Mrs. Tranter would like, indeed is most anxious to help you. You should leave Lyme, this district. I understand that you have excellent qualifications. I cannot leave this place. Miss Woodruff, I will be frank. I have heard it said that you are not altogether of sound mind. I think that is very far from true. Have you not punished yourself enough? You are young, you have no family, I believe, to tie you to Dorset. I have ties. To this French gentleman. Oh, please, please, do not be offended by my illusion. If he returns, I cannot believe that he would be so easily put off as not to discover where you are. He will never return. You fear? He will never return. I have long since received a letter. He is married. Married? Yes, Mr. Smithson. In the moment of shocked surprise, Charles was aware that she stood framed by sunlight that had found its way through a small rift in the clouds. I found these. Two fossils. <laughs> I am most grateful. They are in excellent condition. Thank you for your offer of assistance. I value it. 
Well, since you refused it, you leave me the more grateful. I should not have followed you. You followed me here? Yes. I think it is better if I leave. I have no one to turn to, Mr. No. Smithson. I am told the vicar is an eminently sensible man. It is he who introduced me to Mrs. Pulteney. Well, I repeat, if I can speak on your behalf to Mrs. Tranter, I shall be most happy, but it would be quite improper if of If I me went to... to London, I know what I should become. I should become what some already call me in life. My dear Miss Woodruff. I am weak. How should I not know it? I have sinned. Well, I am sorry for you, but I must confess I don't understand why you should seek to make me your confidant in this matter. Because you have travelled. Because you are educated. Because I live among people the world tells me are kind, pious, Christian people. And they seem to me crueler than the cruelest heathens. Uh, I would speak, but I cannot. Why am I born what I am? Why am I not born Miss Freeman? Now, that question were better not asked. Envy is forgivable envy in your situation. Look, it is beyond my powers to help you here. I will not believe that. No, I have offended you. <sighs> you must surely realise that any greater intimacy between us, however innocent in its intent, is quite impossible. I ask only, I should like to tell you of what happened 18 months ago. I... I... Miss Woodruff, are you unwell? I beg you, I'm not mad. But unless I'm helped, I shall be. No, stand up, please. Control yourself. If we are seen... Yesterday I was nearly overcome by madness. I had to see you, to speak to you. I would have come to the white line where you reside had some last remnant of sanity not prevented me. No, but this is unforgivable. <laughs> Unless I mistake, you now threaten me with scandal. No, I would rather die than you think that of me. I have no one. Please. It... Can you not comprehend? Please, stand. I must go. I'm expected at Mrs. Tranter's. I walk in the afternoon here each Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday. When I have no other that, I must repeat that I find myself amazed that I you should ask think that... but one hour of your time. You should do me such service that I would follow whatever advice you gave. It must certainly be that we do not continue to do risk... Do I have your agreement? Yes. I cannot find the words to thank you. I will be here on the days I have said. And now I will detain you no longer. Good night, Miss Freeman. Mrs. Tranter. Good night. Good night, Charles. Good night. I have called for the port, gentlemen. Good night, Dr. Grogan. Good night, Charles. And sweet dreams of drapery. Good night, my darling. Well, it's been a pleasant evening, sir. Indeed, a refreshing one. Uh, for me also, Doctor. You add, if I may say, a pleasing astringency to Lyme society. I know most of its pretensions and pomposities after 30 or more years. <laughs> I have been wanting to ask you whether you have any interest in paleontology. Mrs. Tranta warned me of this. No, sir, I'd better own up. When we know more of the living, that will be the time to pursue the dead. <laughs> uh, I was introduced the other day to a specimen of the local flora that inclines me partly to agree with you. A very strange case. And no doubt you know more of it than I. I think her name is Woodruff? Ah, yes. Poor tragedy. Am I being indiscreet? She is perhaps a patient. Let me just say... We know more about the fossils out on that beach than we do about what takes place in that girl's mind. <laughs> melancholia of the third type. Obscure melancholia. No clear cause. But she has an occasion for sadness, has she not? Is she the first young woman to be jilted? In strict confidence, Smithson. I've spoken to her at length. I've offered her help. Found her a governess's place in Exeter with a colleague. But you could offer that girl the throne of England, and she'd still shake her head. It's as if she has become addicted to melancholy as one is addicted to opium. I see. Now, I take it, um, I take it you have read The Origin of Species. Huh. 
this fellow Darwin. You should know better than to call a great man by such a name. Forgive me. I am ever cautious in company. I am a Darwinist, sir, convinced. Ah, then let me take your hand. <laughs> you know, there is much which science cannot explain, sir, but much which it assuredly can. <laughs> If you had a little, Mr. Charles, please. I have decided, Sam, that I do not need you here. You may return to Kensington. You have nothing to say? Well, I'd be happy to raise, sir. Well, I have decided that you are up to no good. I am well aware that that is your natural condition, but I prefer you to be up to no good in London, which is more used to up to no gooders. Well, I haven't done anything, Mr. Charles. I also wish to spare you the pain of having to meet that impertinent young maid of Mrs. Tranter's. Is that not kind of me? Well, she has made apologies, sir, for being so disrespectful to me. I've accepted them. What? From a mere milkmaid? Impossible. Well, it was out of innocence, Mr. Charles. I see. Then matters are worse than I thought. Now, I want the truth. <sighs> My goose is cooked, sir. Cooked it is. In 48 hours, Sam. Well, we're not horses. We're human beings, sir. We will not go to that house again, or address the young woman in the street until I have spoken to Mrs. Tranter and found whether she permits your attentions. We've talked it all through already, sir. The other morning, when you were visiting. Oh, Sam. Sam, Sam, Sam. Miss Woodruff. Mr Smithson, I'm very pleased that you've come. I must congratulate you. You have a real genius for finding eeries. For finding solitude. Most sumptuous views. It is a kind of amphitheatre. And I'm sure that rock is your seat. Miss Woodruff, I detest immorality, but morality without mercy I detest rather more. I promise not to be too severe a judge. Please, proceed. His name was Vargan. He was brought to Captain Talbot's, where I was a governess after the wreck of his ship. He was in great pain those first few days, and yet he never cried. And when the doctor dressed his wound, he would clench my hand so hard that one day I nearly fainted. He spoke English? Uh, just a few words. I know some French. Ah. Oh, I have no little education, Mr. Smithson. <laughs> I didn't mean to be disrespectful. Perhaps he was the devil in the guise of a sailor. He was very handsome. No man had ever paid me the kind of attentions that he did. He made advances, in short. Yes. We spoke only in French. And very often, I did not comprehend perfectly what he was saying. He called me cruel when I would not let him kiss my hand. A day came when I thought myself cruel as well. And so, you were cruel no longer? Yes. If I again recovered... It came to within a week of the time when he should take his leave. And by then he had declared his attachment to me. There was talk of marriage. He made me believe that his whole happiness depended on my accompanying him. Mine as well. My life has been steeped in loneliness, Mr Smithson. He knew my father was a tenant farmer, bankrupted, then quickly dead. How I was without means or close relatives... Vargan left to take the Weymouth packet. He told me that he should wait in the town until I joined him. I swore I would never do it. But as one day passed, and then another, and he was no longer there to talk to, I was overcome by solitude and despair. I gather all this was concealed from the Talbots. Yes. Were not your suspicions aroused by this secrecy? Perhaps I always knew... I told Mrs. Talbot of an old school friend lying ill. I went to Weymouth on this pretext. Uh, spare yourself, Miss Woodruff. I can guess. No, I must tell all. I went to the inn. It was not a respectable place. I was expected to go up to him. I insisted he be sent for. He seemed overjoyed to see me. He was all that a lover should be. I was frightened. He was attentive, full of smiles. But I knew that if I hadn't come, he would have been neither surprised nor long saddened. The veil dropped before my eyes. I saw he was insincere, a liar, 
I saw all this within five minutes of meeting. I know that a respectable woman would have left at once. Yes, well, you need proceed no further. I've searched my soul a thousand times since that evening. Mr. Smithson, my innocence was false from the moment I chose to stay. Indeed. I gave myself to him. Yes. I am a doubly dishonoured woman by circumstances and by choice. I did not ask you to tell me these yes, things. Yes, I must. What I beg you to understand is not that I did this shameful thing, but why I did it. I did it so that I should never be the same again. So that people should point at me and yet never comprehend the reason for my crime. Sometimes I think I have a freedom they cannot understand because I have set myself beyond the pale. I am the French lieutenant's whore. Miss Woodruff. I see your shock. It is clear in your face. Look, I confess I do not understand this talk of freedom of beyond the pale. <laughs> Come. Compose yourself. I would wish to be of some comfort to you. I returned and told Mrs. Talbot I had met him and that he would return to marry me. A month later, I received his letter making himself out an unhappy husband. I told him I wished never to see him again. And you have concealed that from everyone but myself? Yes. In order to be what I must be. An outcast. In you, I detected an intelligence, a sympathy. Uh, Do you forgive me my sin? You are forgiven now, perhaps and we And may ought... be forgotten. I am like this thorn tree here. No one reproaches it for growing here in this solitude. It is when it walks down Broad Street that it offends society. But my dear Miss Woodruff, you cannot tell me it is your duty to offend society. Is it not that society wishes to remove me to another solitude? I do not comprehend your attitude. What you now question is the justice of existence. That is forbidden. Not forbidden, no, not, not forbidden. Your directness of language and thought matches the directness of your look, Miss Woodruff. Such questioning is not forbidden, but it is fruitless. I beg now. New surroundings, new faces... Yes, I hear you. I must come to Mrs. Tranter's. Excellent. That is the wise decision which I hoped you would make. There will, of course, be no necessity to speak of our meetings. I will say nothing. Good. And now, we really had better descend. Yes. Thank you. I do not deserve such kindness. Say no more about it. Please, let us walk on. Wait! Stop! Stop here! They're on the track. My God! Here's my servant, Sam. Mrs. Tranter's maid. We must be silent. No explanation of our meeting would suffice for a moment. Calm yourself, Mr. Smithson. Calm yourself. Uh, what do you say to a little rest just there? Yeah, this is a nice spot for it. A little sit down. Come on. No, there's mud there, Sam. Look. Oh, come on. Sit down. <laughs> ah, you're a devil. I am that. And I'm your devil. Mm. Every bit of me. <laughs> what is happening? Mr. Smithson. <laughs> Can you not see? Oh. And then, as Sarah threw up a glance at Charles, she smiled. A smile so shocking, so naked. A smile that seemed to say, Where are your pretensions now? Your birth, your etiquette, your social class. For a long moment, a silence hung between them. Charles saw that he really did stand with one foot over the precipice. He knew if he reached out his arms, he would meet a passionate reciprocity of feeling. Aye, aye. Come back here, you little fox. I'm no fox. I'm a vixen, you silly boy. At last, Charles broke the silence. We must never meet alone again. You had better go. I will wait a half hour. Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Smithson. My God, my God, you have been playing with fire, my boy. Come in. 
Sam, where have you been? It's not like you to take a country stroll. I have interests in the town, sir. Hmm. And Mrs Tranter has given her blessing to him. Or so you had me believe, sir. Yes. What did you want? A telegram, sir. Oh. Ah. Well. My uncle requires my urgent attendance at Winsiet. Do you know, Sam, I think that may be very good news. Away, then send my apologies to Miss Freeman. I will take my leave of her in an hour, but we'll be back within two days. Hurry up, man, hurry up. You require my presence, sir? <laughs> yes, of course. No, but don't worry, young love will not be tested long. Now get on with you. Yes, sir. Well, a telegram from Uncle means only one thing, Anastina. We have come into our fortune. He is planning an internal abdication and will be asking his favoured nephew to take on his estate. So let us now leave Charles in the happy certainty of difficulties surmounted, crises averted and futures decided. Strict Victorian order is re-established. The Undercliff and its secrets are banished and the country seat contemplated. In the following hours, Charles leaves for Wiltshire, while his fiancée waits in line in happy expectation. But wait. Let me reset my watch a moment. Because before Charles had returned to the inn and received his telegram, indeed before he had even removed himself from the clinging ground cover of the undercliff, an observer would have seen Sarah hesitate as she reached the edge of the woods. Voices heard from the dairy arrested her progress, but instead of remaining in the shadows until it was safe, she walked boldly out into the cart track in full view of two women at the cottage door below. One of these women was the dairyman's wife, the other Mrs. Pookley's housekeeper. Well, would you ever believe you'd seen such a thing? And what effect might this have had on our gentleman's planning? Well, let us see. We have moved forward. Charles has returned from Wiltshire rather sooner than he had imagined. Sooner and somewhat less optimistic in manner. Oh, you're back so soon, Charles. Yes, Mrs. Tranter. My uncle's business was soon finished. Charles has been disinherited. Disinherited? I know perfectly well that for his uncle I am a mere draper's daughter. Ernestina exaggerates. It is simply that my uncle has decided to marry. If he should be so fortunate as to have a son and heir... Her name is Mrs Tompkins, a widow. And young enough to bear a dozen sons. Young enough to be his granddaughter. My dear Tina, all one has in such circumstances is one's dignity. I must beg you for my sake not to be bitter. We must accept the event with as good grace as possible. None is possible. I beg you, please... May we not change the subject? I'm afraid that in the circumstances I entirely lack inspiration. Very well. Uh, tell me, Mrs Tranter, what happenings have taken place in Lyme today? Oh, did you get the news of her? Well, there has been an event. Mrs Pulteney has dismissed Miss Woodruff. Charles? You are looking as ashen as I. You, you see, a change of subject is no good at all. Uh, no, no, it is only the effects of the journey... Uh, please, continue. Mrs. Pulteney... Has dismissed Miss Woodruff. Last evening. She was allowed a final night at Marlborough House. Then a porter took her trunk to the White Lion. My hotel? That is the stage for the coaches. Miss Woodruff was not there. There's been no sign of her, and no reason given for the dismissal. She ought never to have been employed at Marlborough House. It was like offering that pious wolf of a Pulteney a wounded lamb to devour. There is no danger of... Alas, that is what we all fear. The vicar has sent men to search along towards Charmouth. She walks there, you know, on the cliffs. Uh, Dr Grogan, has he not been called to Marlborough House? I know he is concerned for her situation. He, he raised her case the other night after dinner. He is most angry by all accounts. I shall not call on Mrs Pulteney, however ill she is. And perhaps I should call on Grogan. Oh, Charles, what on earth can you do? <sighs> Mm. 
Mr. Swenson, sir. Yes, what is it? I'm in a hurry. A note left for you, sir. Thank you. Sam? Sam? I beg to see you one last time. I will wait this afternoon and tomorrow morning. If you do not come, I shall never trouble you again. Sam! Sam! Yes, Mr. Charles. Go and find out who left me this note. It was a boy, Mr. Charles. When? Ten this morning. What are you staring at? I wasn't staring at nothing, Mr. Charles. Tell them to send up my supper. Anything. Yes, Mr. And Charles. And I do not wish to be disturbed. You may lay out my things later. Come. No, sir. Who gave it to you? The same boy has come this morning with the others, sir. He says it was from the same woman as before, but he doesn't know her name. We call her the French... Yes, yes, yes! Give me the note, man! Leave us! <sighs> Sam, I have interested myself in an unfortunate woman's case here. I wished... That is, I still wish to keep the matter from Mrs. Tranter at the moment. You understand? Perfectly, Mr. Charles. I hope to establish the person in a situation more suited to her abilities. And then, of course, I shall tell Mrs. Tranter. It, it is a little surprise. A return for her hospitality, she is concerned for the woman. Uh, and so, th though it is not important at all, you will speak of this to no one? Of course not, Mr. Charles. You may go. Sir? In French, and unsealed. The folly, the utter folly. Je vous ai attendu, I have waited for you all day. I ask you, a woman on her knees begs you to help her in her despair. I will spend the night praying for your arrival. From dawn I will be waiting at the barn by the sea, at the first sentier gauche, the first path on the left after the farm. You know where the girl is at the moment? No, but I am sure that tomorrow morning she will be where she indicates. But of course you will not be there. You cannot. You are already compromised. Yes, I am in your hands. I have now called off the search. Good. You have told me what has passed between you, Smithson. And I profess myself astounded. My actions have been throughout motivated by honourable concern. I see. Well... Swear on this book. No, it's not the Lord's work. The origin of species. Come on, man. Nothing that has or will be said here will go beyond these walls. I swear. Right. Now, I am a young woman of superior intelligence and some education, not fully in command of my emotions. Uh, I have tragic eyes. A professional line in the way of looking melancholy. I have thrown myself at the first handsome rascal who crossed my path. Enter a young man, intelligent, good-looking, a specimen of that class my education has taught me to admire. I see he is interested in me, and the sadder I am, the more interested this good Samaritan becomes. He pities me for the pitiable past I have fed him. Now... I must make him pity my present. I engineer my own dismissal. I disappear in circumstances which cry out a presumption of suicide. Then I cry to my gentlemanly saviour for help. This is hypothesis. She walked most flagrantly out of the woods in front of Mrs. Fairley, the housekeeper. I cannot believe it is possible. Oh, it is possible, ma'am. Then I have been led by the nose. Ah, uh, quite. However... Though Miss Woodruff is deranged, she's no schemer. It is an illness, a desperation to be seen and to be taken care of. I cannot believe this of her. That is because you are half in love with her. That observation is highly insulting to Miss Freeman. Oh, I agree. But who is making the insult? Know thyself, Smithson. Know thyself. I believe I am coming to. Mm. Do you have anything to drink? Eh. Have. Brandy. It is simple. I fear I am not made for marriage. 
My misfortune is to have lived too much and then to have realised too late. Let me put you through the old catechism. Do you wish to hear her? Do you wish to see her? Do you wish to touch her? If you knew the mess my life was in. The lack of purpose. Duty. Anything. You're not the first man to doubt his choice of bride. Ernestina <laughs> understands so little of what I really am. How could she understand you? She's hardly out of the school. It is not her fault. I shall honour my vows to her. Of course you will, man, of course. Oh, Grogan, what am I to do? First, tell me your real sentiments towards the other. I do not know. Remember the catechism? There is something noble in her. Even now her face rises before me, denying all you have said of her. Yes, well, it would, would it not? Oh, you are ensnared. Very well, then. Early tomorrow I shall put on my walking boots and I shall tell her, Smithson, that you have been unexpectedly called away. And I shall tell her that for your own good. You must go, Smithson. I have urgent business in London. And before you go, I suggest that you lay the whole matter before Miss Freeman. I, I had already decided on that. Good. Then our business is complete. You are not thinking of committal for Miss Woodruff? No, no. Uh, a place where her spiritual wounds can heal. A doctor who knows what to do, how to treat kindly. This feels like treachery to her. If it's any reassurance to you, you would have to bear the expense. Of course. Where would you then? I feel you have saved my life. I will be eternally in your debt. Then let me inscribe your bride's name on the bill of credit. <laughs> Away. And so we have a resolution. The matter concluded. Or so it would seem. So how has it come to pass that next morning, Charles is still somehow unconvinced? Has he not agreed to all that Grogan suggests? And yet, does he feel that there is something in Grogan's manner, in his damning of Sarah as a troubled hysteric? A refusal to recognize that this young woman from a humble background might be Charles' equal? Indeed, his superior. And is there also perhaps a feeling that in his account to Grogan, Charles might have misrepresented Sarah's strangeness, that he may have condemned her to avoid condemning himself. As dawn rises, Charles is looking from his hotel window and contemplating destiny. And those eyes. At dawn, he changes into his walking clothes. If he meets Grogan, then he meets him. Charles reaches the barn, half hidden in the edge of the woodland. He approaches, he opens the door, and there, in the hay, is the sight which first greeted him on that hidden plateau in the undercliff. Sarah, lying asleep. Miss Woodruff? Miss Woodruff, please, wake up. Oh, forgive me. Forgive me. I will wait by the door. Yes. Oh. Mr. Smithson, thank you for coming. May we not be discovered in this place? No, it is Axminster Market today. As soon as a dairyman is milked, he'll be gone. You have passed the night here? Yes. You are not hungry? No. You know what has happened? Yes. I was away all yesterday. I could not come soon. Mrs. Portney was most angry with me. It is no doubt for the best. You were ill-placed in her home. Where am I not ill-placed? Now come. You must not feel sorry for yourself. There has been very great concern. A search party was out looking for you last night. I did not mean to cause such trouble. Well, never mind. I dare say they enjoyed the excitement. But it is clear that you really must now leave Lyme. Do not fear. No. I have come to help you. Yes. You deserve 
assistance. I kiss your hand. Oh, Miss Woodruff, please. I have told you a lie. I made sure Mrs. Farrelly saw me walk out of the wood. I knew she would tell my employer. I knew I would be dismissed. Please forgive me. But why? I think you understand what drives me, Mr. Smithson. I am sure that you do. Miss Woodruff. Sarah. Control yourself. I cannot. I cannot. Please. We must. We cannot. <clears throat> <clears throat> No. There is someone outside. Indeed there is. And it is not Dr. Grogan. In The French Lieutenant's Woman by John Fowles, the narrator was John Hurt. Charles was played by Jonathan Firth. Ernestina, Kelly Riley. Sarah Emily Bruni, Mrs. Tranter Elizabeth Spriggs, Mrs. Pultney Susan Jameson, Sam Nick Sace, Dr. Grogan T. P. McKenna, Dairyman Jared McDermott, Mary Ella Smith, Mrs. Fairley Colleen Prendergast, and Osler Wayne Foskett. The French Lieutenant's Woman was dramatized by Graham White. The director was Peter Kavanagh.